Thomas St. Elaine. I'm a graduate of the Massachusetts School of Law, who are beginning the first chapter of, or, or a local chapter of the International Law Students Association. And I'd like to welcome State Representative Frank Moran from Lawrence, who strongly believes in serving the underserved. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you to the students at the Massachusetts School of Law for hosting this great event, especially Sean and Joseph. I'm excited to have all of you here today for a number of reasons. One, welcome to the People's House. It is a public building and it represents the kind of hope and hard work you commit to in your education and your communities. I said, Dominican American, my story is like many of yours. I have learned that hard work and perseverance are the key to success. While I'm not a lawyer, I consider my personal responsibility to do what I can to improve the lives of many constituents and the lives of Massachusetts residents every day. I believe what many people in this building believe in, that is that we all have our own stories that call us to public service. We have all faced challenges, both big and small, on the way to achieving our goals, and I commend all of you on your hard work thus far. I hope that you always remember that you are not alone on this journey of learning and service. All across Massachusetts are beacons of hope, a great example of what it means to be in public service. City Councilor Michelle Wu is one such person. Even before she was elected to the Boston City Council in 2013, she has been a small business owner, an attorney, and a community advocate. She has been a voice for women, a champion for families, and helping hand for those who need it, who need it most. I hope you help me today in giving her an applause. Welcome to the State House, <laughs> Councilor Michelle Wu. Thank you so much, Representative Moran, for that very generous introduction and for your commitment and work. I, see, I have seen the representative out and about all across Massachusetts, and, um, and in, it's my honor to be here in this hall of government, which is not my home of City Hall down the street, but a place where so many committed people come to work every day for the citizens of the Commonwealth. I want to thank you all for the invitation to speak with you. I sat in your seats not too long ago. I graduated from law school in 2012 from Harvard Law School. And like many of you, I'm a first generation law student and also a first generation American. My parents immigrated from Taiwan to the United States in 1983. And when they arrived, they had nothing in their pockets, didn't speak English, just came for that dream. That sense that here was a place where hard work could open up doors, and they wanted to raise a family here. So I'm the oldest of four kids, and when we grew up, it was never a discussion about politics or government. It was just about, did you finish your homework? Did you, or did you practice piano, play sports, and, and do well in school? I got to college and still never thought about government, had never seen anyone in politics that looked like me, never met anyone who ran for office before, and I remember the first week of freshman year of college, everybody was going around introducing themselves, saying, where are you from? And someone said, also say whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. And they all went around. I got really nervous when it got to me because I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know. We had never talked about at home politics or anything. So that was the level of my political awareness at a fresh, as a freshman in college. So the fact that you all are here today participating in civic affairs and getting involved in government is an incredible uh, credit to you all and the difference that you're making today in your communities and that you will continue to make as leaders. I didn't understand at that point how much government mattered. I finished my degree in economics, got a great job working in business downtown, and probably would still be doing something like that if I hadn't gotten a phone call from home. My littlest sister, who was 12 years younger than me, called and said, there's something very wrong with mommy. You have to come home. 
And in my family, over about a three month period, my mom began to struggle with mental illness and went from being the center of our family, the person who took care of everything, made sure we were fed and had clean clothes and did our homework. She went from being that pillar to someone who couldn't take care of my sisters anymore and couldn't take care of herself either. So at the age of 22, I found myself a mom to my sisters, a mom to my mom, running a family business, and all of a sudden I had to deal with government a whole lot. It was trying to get my sisters into a good school. It was trying to get the business open and having to go through permitting and licensing and this and that red tape just so my family could make a living and we could help our neighborhood. And it was in healthcare for my mom, an immigrant who had a whole cultural dimension to her mental illness that we needed to find the right provider and find the right access to healthcare to be able to serve. So I decided at that point I was going, I had enough of being frustrated with government. I was gonna do something about it. I came back to Boston for law school went to Harvard and decided to study how city governments can make neighborhoods better. Now, it just so happens that my first year law professor was brilliant and strict and just the terrifying because she was so good at what she did, so smart. Her name was Elizabeth Warren and she ended up running for the United States Senate in my third year of law school. So I signed up. I, don't tell my parents, I stopped going to classes my third year, I just was volunteering on the campaign full time, and ended up seeing the political side too, that policy is important, and it's important for people who bring different perspectives to be at the table, but the politics is just as important. And unless you can take those ideas, get them out to the community, get people engaged who might not usually be participating, you're not going to fully help the community. You need people to, have to feel connected to government and politics. So on her campaign, I played the role of statewide constituency director, where I reached out to immigrant families like my own, families that didn't speak English at home, people with disabilities, women, the LGBT community, veterans, any group that wasn't defined by a specific geography, but by an interest that was under my purview. And we found that what people say in politics, the sort of standard line of politics, if you go after your, the good voters and don't waste your time with everyone else, that, that's not what politics should be. If you take the time and bring politics, bring policy to a community, even if they are traditionally ignored, even if they're an underserved community, once you connect government to them, give them a way to participate. Give people the opportunity and the motivation to get involved. Then everyone comes out to vote, everyone comes out to participate, and we see a more vibrant, more inclusive society. So after that campaign for Senator Warren, I announced that I was running for city council myself, and as a first-time candidate at the age of 28, uh, was very lucky to be elected and have now, I'm now almost at the end of my first term. I'm still the, the youngest current counselor, the, the second Asian American, the first Asian American woman, first Chinese American to serve on the council. And these are badges of both honor, but also very serious responsibilities and, and sometimes a burden. To be the only one representing a certain group in government is tough because it's, while I feel so lucky to, to be able to speak up and bring issues of immigrant families to the table, I feel that it would be much easier and much better for everyone if there were more representatives there, more representatives there fighting the fight at the seats of government. So my big ask for you all today is finish your law degrees, but after that, seriously think about running for office. We need young, smart, dynamic people in government, and I want you not to listen to the, the folks who might say, just wait, wait your turn, wait until you've got a certain number of years of experience or accomplished this or that first or built up this or that, you'll know when you're ready to serve and when you're ready to step out and, and give that gift to your community. Because it's not about you, it's not about me. It's about the people that are families struggling who need help from government. It's about the residents who don't have anywhere else to turn. And this is the one industry, the one business government 
It's the one industry where your entire focus is on helping people. I get to wake up every day and think, what can I do today to make life a little bit better for just a few people in Boston? And it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm convinced I have the best job in the world. Over this last term, I have introduced two laws at the city level that set national headlines, one for paid parental leave. The United States is one of two countries around the world that doesn't offer any form of paid maternity leave. We wonder why there's great income inequality and gender disparity in our country. And you look at the fact that once someone has a baby, they're not given paid time off, and they're either forced to take unpaid time or get out of the workforce altogether and then have a much harder time getting back in. It, is a direct, it has a direct disproportionate effect on women, on people of color, on immigrants. And so we at the city of Boston said, we're not going to wait for federal government to act. We're not going to wait for the state government to act. We're doing it today in Boston. After we passed our law, the state started to act as well. And it was just one example of what we can do immediately in government to help people. I had a, a very strict time, time deadline on that. We introduced the bill in April. And then all of a sudden, every city employee started coming up to me and saying, my due date is in three weeks. My wife is going to give birth in four weeks. You have to get this passed. So I got it done as quick as I could. Um, and there are, there are many other ideas and many other policies that we've been able to implement. Healthcare equity, communications access for those who are limited English proficient, wage theft protections for our most vulnerable workers who are exploited. These are the range of issues that we get to work on that I've had the pleasure of thinking about in my first term in office. And again, for me, having a legal background has made all the difference. It's the ability to look at a problem, analyze the exact issues, and then think about how to connect that to real solutions. So I don't know how many people are planning today to run for office, but give it a try. Work in government one of your summers. Think about spending some time in the State House or at City Hall. And then when you're ready, step out and put your hat in the ring for your community. We need you to participate. We need you to keep doing what you're doing. And I thank you so much for inviting me and for your leadership that you have shown every single day. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. The International Law Student Association is a very diverse group. We have approximately 150 different chapters um, globally. And the theme of today's event is called Breaking Barriers. And we have some very historic individuals who will be sharing their stories today. Uh, Cesar, um, Cesar Vargas, he is the very first undocumented immigrant that the New York State Supreme Court ruled um, can practice law. He will be admitted in, June, in uh, December 2015. We also have today um, Erica Andola, and she is the very first undocumented immigrant to ever work in Congress. And we also have Julissa Acre. She will be telling her story about what happens when an individual faces challenges, um, when there is not enough support um, and enough, enough policy and procedure in place to support someone like herself who had to go through struggles um, just to stay afloat and keep herself um, mobile. Thank you so much. Um, we will now introduce um, Mr. Vargas, and he's going to share a little bit about his story and who he is. Thank you all so much for having me, and it's just amazing and beautiful to be in this building. And uh, even though I am a proud New Yorker, which I think that might get me in physical danger in Boston, <laughs> I'm still proud to say that. But uh, thank you so much, Sean. Thank you so much for uh, Massachusetts Law School for inviting me. I think it's really an op opportunity to speak with the community in Boston, but across the country, and be able to tell our stories. I think stories are very powerful, not just because 
uh, we just because someone's telling about their life experience, but because storytelling does change hearts and minds. For me, you know, I think there's a vivid moment that I, for example, you know, really came to understand what it means to be undocumented. Um, last December, I mean, last year, I found myself walking across a red carpet on a well-lit stage. It was to be one of the most memorable moments of my life, and one of the most memorable moments that many students here will, will live. Uh, after the tormenting experience of the first year, second year, and third year, it will get there. And that moment was my law school graduation. Um, it was an amazing experience. My family was on, uh, in the audience. My seven-year-old mother was, was there, proud. At 70 years old, one of her reasons to come to this country was to give me a better life. She left the U.S after my father passed away when I was five years old. She took the decision to give me a better life. She crossed after trying attempting to do the impossible. Now, now I think about you know, what was going through my mom's head. You know, what, what forced a mother to cross a desert with that anything could have happened? She could have been killed, she could have been murdered, she could have been raped. And this is not just abstract possibilities. This happens every single day in the U.S.-Mexico border. Last year, we saw the refugee crisis about with all these children coming here, and many of them were young women, young girls. And just to think about this, there was a, a, a studies there that over 80% of those girls coming here on their own either had condoms on, condoms on them or were already prepared to be raped. That was the cost of them coming to the US. So for me, thinking back where I am now, my mother was a hero because she gave everything that she could to give me a better life. And we always hear the narrative of how, you know, dreamers or young undocumented immigrants who came to the US as children bear no fault. I came to the U.S. when I was five years old at the hands of my mother. I should be, you know, just given a free pass and the blame goes to my mother. But I can tell you that any parent, any mother would sacrifice their own life for their children. And for me, my mother's a hero and regardless of what the politicians in Washington or on either side say, I will never place blame on my mother. Because that is something that we are born to uh, embrace and born to actually you know, hold dear in our hearts. And for me, graduating from law school was simply a, a, a natural direction of what my mom's American dream was. You know, she always says that in la familia tiene que haber un abogado o un doctor. In the family, we always have a, a doctor or a lawyer to defend the family, to defend the community. And even now, right now, you know, I'm still, I'm still waiting for my bar admission, and she gets me in trouble a lot of times because she always tells all her friends, all the neighbors, my son's a lawyer, he could take your case. I'm like, mom, I don't have my license. Don't get me this bar before I even get barred. So, but you know, that's, that's why I do it. You know, that's why I actually went to law school. And that's why I, I graduated and passed the tormenting New York bar, bar exam because even though at the end of the tunnel, I didn't know whether I was going to be admitted. I didn't know whether I was actually going to be practiced. I didn't even know whether I was even going to get the Esquire title that many of us so dearly hold tight. I knew that I had to make my mom proud. Because for me, the American dream is my mom's American dream. And my mom's American dream was not a fancy car, not a nice house. My mom's American dream was working hard for her family. And that's what it means for me, that American dream. Now I tell my story for two, main, for two main purposes. One, because I wanna be able to demonstrate to young people, whether they're undocumented or not, that there is a fighting chance. That there's a community out there willing to support you. There is people in school, at the workforce, who are willing to fight for you. I would not have been here 
if it wasn't for the people in my community, my family, and in, in law school, the dean who was able to secure private funding for me to get where I am. It would be so egocentric for me to say, great, I'm a lawyer, I did it all myself. But I can never forget all those people who stood by me. Second of all, and I think most importantly, and uh, the councilwoman did an amazing job, is that you know, my story and the story that you're gonna hear from Erica and Julissa and many of the stories here, you know, that, is, that is the values of what this nation was based on, right? It was not about where you came from. You could come from England, Germany, Ireland, you name it. What matter if you believe in certain principles, if you believe in a nation that values freedom and equality, then you are an American. Whether your citizenship, whether you have citizenship or not. And for me, when I, you know, actually we had a conversation with one of my friends uh, last time, and you know, we were actually discussing, uh, discussing the American flag, and you know, uh, you know, we were just talking about what it means to look at the flag. And for me, you know, it's, it has that duality of what it means for me. You know, on one hand, it means that I can't vote. It means that I could be deported. It means I don't have my license. But at the same time, it means, it means home. It, this is my country. This is my home. I'm a New Yorker. Um, you know, I'm, as they say, I'm like, if not broken, born and raised, definitely adopted by New York City. And this is what I want to do. And that's why I want to be a lawyer. And that's why I think it's so important for us to continue this conversation. Because I refuse to give up on the idea of what it means to be American. We are seeing the conversation of Donald Trump's out there. We are seeing the conversations on either side. And regardless of where you stand on the issue of immigration policy and politics, and as we all know, lawyers can argue on either side. And in Washington, D.C., you know, it's, it's very, you know, just shocking how there's literally someone out there who believes the opposite of what you believe in. You like puppies, someone doesn't like puppies. It's really that true. But, you know, you know bringing it back to what, you know, what it means for me to stand here, what it means to be here in this, in this town. And for me, it really means being an American. And as simple as that sounds, as simple as those beliefs of, of being there, working hard, that's what it means. Because on June, on June 4th, New York State ruled that undocumented immigrants can practice law. And what they found was simply this, that no matter where you come from, no matter what your immigration status, if you go to school, if you work hard, you can be a lawyer. And that opens the door to, to so many people who are working as either as dentists, doctors, engineers, uh, hairstylists, plumbers. You know, it's, it's, it's opening up the door for that American dream. And I emphasize that word so much because it means so much to me. And just simply, I, I think it's just being here at this room and being here actually in the state, uh, one of them actually my, uh, my you know, one of my uh, favorite presidents, actually the favorite president, is John Adams, who, you know, uh, Boston, Brain, uh, Brain, Brain Street, oh, Brain Street, Brain Street, there you go. You know, and I actually wanted, wanted to go to his house, but I don't know if I'm going to have time. But, you know, I think it's, it's you know, that, that was a, a, a person, a president, who believed in, the, in a new nation, who believed in the principles of a nation who would value, you know, a constitutional liberties and freedom so much that he sacrificed his whole life. Came from, a, his father was a shoemaker, became vice president and president. And it's ironic and very interesting that he never campaigned for a vote to become president. And because he believed that much. And I believe in that, in that dream that much. And I believe in what it means to be American. And, you know, simply when I do get licensed, and I'm standing before the judge, you know, the only thing that I want to be able to, to have and the only thing that I want to value is to have my mother next to me to say, you know, to, for me to say to her, Mom, your son's a lawyer. And for me, 
that is what's going to make me continue to advocate for my community and to fight for my citizenship that I hope to get one day. And a citizenship that means not just for me to go out and vote, not just for me to travel to another country. It's going to be a citizenship that I'm going to fight that means equality for, for everyone, whether you're Latino, white, you name it. We're going to fight for a citizenship that means, because right now we are facing a crisis of, 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 of criminal justice that's outdated, an immigration system that's outdated. And we're seeing both presidential candidates in 2016 discussing those issues. And the councilwoman is right. We need to be involved. We need to demonstrate, our, we need to tell our stories because it's easy for the other side to say, it's easy for Donald Trump to say, Caesar is the other. Erica is those invaders, the rapists, the killers. But you know what? No one can debate my story. No one can challenge your stories. And that's what we need to do. We need to get out there and we need to tell our stories because our stories have the power to change hearts and minds. And we're gonna get it done because we have seen great legislation throughout history that has been, has been inspired by young people. And you know, for me, the worst thing that I have seen is when we have elected officials thrive on fear, on scapegoating immigrants, on scapegoating any type of group. But I have also seen amazing elected, elected officials, amazing community leaders like here in this room that have changed the course of history. And I know through the help of you, each single one of you, not only are we going to pass immigration reform, but we're going to remind this country what we're, we're, we're founded upon, is that American dream to be there for each other. And I want to thank everyone. Sean, I want to thank you for inviting me. I want to thank so much everyone here in Boston for welcoming me in this great state. I'm going to go back to New York, put my Mets hat on. And not here, though. Not here. Not in, not in Massachusetts. But I want to thank everyone, and I appreciate everyone. And uh, I guess I want to introduce uh, Erica Andiola, who, who will be the next speaker. Thank you. It's a beautiful place. I'm really excited to be here. Um, well, my name is Erika Andiola, and I'm actually raised uh, in Arizona, um, and I was born in Mexico. So I'm from Durango, Mexico. Are there any Mexicans in the room other than? Um, all right. Well, I want to get I want to get to know you guys too a little bit. So just just for me to to know, um, how many of you guys are actually for immigrants that born somewhere else other than the United States? Just raise your hand. How many of you are uh, children of immigrants? That's amazing. How many of you guys are like first time college graduates, undergrad? First time college or uh, law school students in the family? That's really amazing. And I ask that because I know, I know what this organization is really about and, and it was really inspiring for me to come and speak to you guys because you're the ones that I look up to. <laughs> I want to be an attorney someday. Um, I actually graduated in 2009 from Arizona State University, and I wanted to be a psychologist back in the day. Uh, I wanted to work with women who were uh, going through domestic violence, and I wanted to figure out a way in which I could find, you know, just to help them out, to figure out how they could work through their, through their problems, because my own mother was a victim of domestic violence. And just Last October, or this past month, I actually went to take the horrible LSAT. <laughs> and I was just sitting there for my second time. First time I did, I did really bad. I didn't study, I didn't practice, nothing. I, you know, I went in there like, oh, it's gonna be like college, you know, where I just like studied the, day, the night before and like went to take the LSAT and I did it really bad. So I went again this, this past October and I went in and I just sat down in this like, huge hall at Arizona State University, and all I saw 
I just looked around and I realized I was the only Latina, literally the only Latina sitting down in the middle of all these folks, right? It scared the heck out of me. I was like, all right, I did horrible the first time. The second time I feel a little more prepared, I took the course. But I'm like, I'm like a minority, like I'm the only Latina here and I'm very unlikely to, you know, to do as well as these other people. I don't know why, I just thought that, right? And it got to, you know, to that point, I just, they were, a lot of people were like finishing before me, you know, how it just like freaks you out, I put their pencil down, like, oh my God, I still have all these questions. And I share this with you because it really reminded me of, of you know, back in college and just going into ASU going into these huge halls in my undergraduate and seeing that not only I was the only, sometimes the only Latina in the classroom, but also I was probably the only undocumented student there. That's what I thought. And I thought to myself, you know, how, how do they, how do all these folks would view me if they knew that I was undocumented? And it, it's, it's a little scary because when you're, when you're little, when you, know, when you get brought to the US, uh, I was 11 when I came, my mom would tell me, don't, don't tell anyone you're undocumented. Don't ever tell people that you are, you know, and at, at that time, we didn't know any better, so she would say, you know, don't say that you're illegal. Um, <laughs> we don't, drop the I word, don't say that. But, you know, we would just call ourselves that because we didn't know any better. And, and, and to me, just being in that college, you know, atmosphere, it was like, they will probably think I'm less than them if I say that I'm undocumented. And so I would always keep it to myself. I always kept to myself. You know, I, I didn't really talk to, to a lot of folks. For, you know, I don't know. It was just, it, it was a scary situation my first year. But in 2009, a little bit actually before that, I graduated that year, but a little bit before that, um, I realized that it wasn't just about feeling, you know, like I was just that minority, but also the fact that I was undocumented. It was, I didn't think it was gonna have such a big effect on my life until I realized that um, Arizona, where I actually live, um, was a state that didn't like immigrants very much. Um, I don't know why my mom took us there, and I love my state, it's a really amazing. Right now, you guys, the weather is awesome, if you guys wanna go. But, you know, there's horrible politics, and they ended up passing this proposition called Proposition 300, which um, didn't allow undocumented students to pay in state tuition, and it forced us to um, basically lose our scholarships. So I had, you know, I, I was, I worked so hard. I worked really hard in high school. Most of my teachers and my counselors would say, you know what, I don't know what to do with you because you have no paper, so just apply to whatever you can. They all need social security. You don't have one, just put zeros there and see what happens. <laughs> and I tried, I, I applied to like 15 different scholarships and I was, you know, fortunate to, to get a lot, you know, a lot of the scholarships. Um, but then Arizona, like I said, you know, started changing its policies, its laws, and I ended up losing all of them. I ended up having to pay three times more. And I was working at a daycare, uh, taking care of babies, uh, being basically paid minimum wage or less than minimum wage because of my status. And so, you know, I think for me, all of that really started made me, I started thinking of how can I, you know, being so afraid, sitting in, this, in, in these classrooms, you know, just full of folks that I don't necessarily think I relate to, how can I actually come out of this and, and, and you know, let people know, like, I, I am that person that you, you just voted to take my tuition away, right? You just literally voted so that I can, like, that I, that I, I can't be here anymore. And so um, in those years, I actually started getting to know a lot of the students there that, are also, that were also undocumented. Um, they lost their scholarships just like me. And we started sharing our stories. We came together because of, of, of a new scholarship that they put together for undocumented students. We started getting to know each other. We started telling our stories. Um, you know, I shared with them that I was really afraid because my mom was actually working at a, at a water park in Arizona. Uh, it was a water park that was actually hiring a lot of undocumented folks, and she happened to get a job there because she needed to, you know, to provide. She was a single mother with five kids or five um, children, and you know, running away from domestic violence from Mexico, all she could do was basically come here with nothing on, on her pocket, but just to, you know, build a better life. She started working at this water park, and at the same time that I was in college, um, I get a call from my mom, you know, telling me that. Um, our sheriff, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, I don't know if you guys ever heard of his name, um, he calls himself the toughest sheriff in, in the country. 
he ends up raiding my, sis my, my mother's work. They take all of her paperwork that she applied with, and she calls me and she says, don't come home because the sheriff just, chair you know, just raided my work. She wasn't there, but they threatened that they were gonna go to everybody's houses and take everybody, right? Um, to, to put him in jail and then send him back to Mexico. And so I think, you know, with all of the stress and, and, and sort of, okay, realizing, yes, it's, it's different. I'm not this regular student. I'm not, you know, like anyone else that can just basically think that, you know, with my social, with my status, with, you know, a lot of the privileges that come with it that I can just move forward with no problem. I, I wasn't able to, to do that, but just hanging out and really talking to a lot of the other dreamers that we realized, you know what, there's, there's something that we're not doing right. There's something that's missing here. And that is the fact that we're still afraid. We're still sitting in that classroom. We're still thinking that we're like, that, that we don't relate to anyone else. That's because we're not telling them our stories. And so that's when we actually decided to come out of the shadows. And we decided to form a beautiful, amazing movement that started growing in 2000 and around 2009 called the Dreamer Movement. And that's when um, the, the Dream Act was actually introduced and the Dream Act was that path for us to, you know, to have some sort of citizenship at some point in our, in our lives. And so the Dream Act was introduced and we said, you know what, something can happen. You know, we can actually rally about something that Congress can pass. And um, I relate a lot to the, the councilwoman, which says that she didn't know anything about politics. I didn't either, trust me. Like I was in my, 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 was in my third year of college. We're giving out all these pamphlets about the Dream Act. And I'm like, yeah, if you can call these this guy on this pamphlet, it was like Senator McCain. I didn't know who he was. Like, I swear, they're like, oh, okay. I don't, need, I don't know why, but you need to call him and tell him to pass the DREAM Act. You know, somebody told me that he can do it. <laughs> and and, and it, was, it went from that to literally, okay, how the heck do we get 60 senators, or 50 senators, or 100 senators, sorry, and all these members of Congress to actually like us and, 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 and understand that we are good people. So we started going to Washington, and at some point we said, you know what, if we're so afraid and people don't hear our stories, and if all of these politicians are saying that we're horrible people, that we're criminals, that we're, you know, nowadays I guess we're rapists because, you know, Trump thinks we are, let's go to them and let's ask them, if you really think we're these horrible people, then deport us. Easy, right? We're right here in front of you, deport us. So we grabbed our caps and gowns, you know, it was like the signature of the dreamers. And um, we went into one of the offices of the senators and we sat on the floor for the first time in, you know, in the history of the dreamer movement, the second time actually went on there, we sat there and we said, we're here, deport us. If you really think we're horrible people, deport us. Next thing you know, you know, they're literally asking us to leave <laughs> like please don't do this to us we can't afford to lose the campaign this is actually a democratic senator who was very supportive but they didn't want to push this forward they didn't want to put it on the on the floor and in, in the senate and we said put it on the floor and if you don't think we deserve to be here then deport us and this was like the very first time at least for me that i understood you know what this is a way to to do this this is the way to actually let other people know who we are, let other people understand our struggle, is to actually come out of the shadows and tell them our stories. And just like Cesar said, they are the most powerful tool that you can have, in, sometimes in politics, but also to make change happen in this country. And so, you know, we were able to push the DREAM Act all the way to a vote, but it failed in 2010 uh, by five votes. Five senators didn't vote for it. And we were able to, for the first time ever, an entire movement not of people who could vote, but people who can't vote. People who were literally in the shadows a couple of years previous to that, we were able to push the President of the United States to say, you know what, these people deserve an opportunity after we followed him everywhere, after we interrupted his speeches, after we did all kinds of things. I know some of you love Obama, you know, I, I agree with a lot of things that he does, but you know, he was deporting a lot of dreamers. And we said, he's deporting dreamers, we're going after him. And, and at some point we were able to get the White House to understand what we were trying to tell him. And for the first time ever, we were able to get dreamers to push the president to announce something called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And thanks to that, we have tons of dreamers across the country who can work, 
who can, you know, actually travel, some of them, to their countries of origin that I hadn't been there. And we're now, you know, at, at a point that we can say we have the power to move things in this country. And if we, as dreamers, as people like Cesar said, who can't really vote, can do this, I can assure you guys that if we get together as millennials, as young people, as first time, you know, college students in your family, as attorneys, soon to be attorneys, trust me, we can actually change so many things in this country. And I am standing here, like I said before, really looking up to you because I know, I don't know what my LSAT score is going to be. <laughs> But either way, I, I am going to get to that point that I can, you know, be there with you guys. Perhaps, I don't know if I would get accepted here, but, you know, at some point I'm going to be there. And I'm not going to be the only Latina that's going to sit there. I'm not going to be the only minority or the only undocumented student because I know that people like Cesar already made it happen. And I know that people like you guys have already made that step forward for other people of color, for other people that perhaps, you know, regardless of their status, perhaps they didn't have the father or a mother, or the, stat, or the economic status, or whatever it is that is making us really stop and say, you know, I'm different than everyone else. Trust me, they all probably saying the same thing about themselves. So we just come together, share our stories, and realize that we can make a lot of change happen. And um, right now, I am still inspired to continue to fight. My mom is still undocumented. I have DACA, but my mom is actually in deportation proceedings. Um, I. You know, so, uh, it was shared before that I was the first person to work in Congress as an undocumented person. But that same day that I got the job in Congress, um, after I got my work permit, I was able to get the job. That same day, I came home to celebrate with my mom, and ICE came to my house, knocked on the door, and took her and my brother. And so, to me, you know, again, this is very personal. And to me, I do want to be able to be an attorney someday so I can say, you know what, I'm not there just for, to have a nice car. I'm not there to have you know, a nice house. I'm there because there's a lot of people in my community, like my mother, who are going to be struggling with their status, that are going to be struggling losing their home, that are going to be struggling with so many issues that we, as people of color, sometimes can't relate. It can say, you know, I'm here to help you. I'm here to be able to you know, relate to you because I went through it and I want to be able to, you know, move things forward in this country together with you. And so again, I am so happy to be here. I am very inspired by you all. And, you know, please invite me again, but not in the cold because I'm from Arizona. <laughs> um, and thank you so much all for, for being here. And whenever you all graduate, I'll be here if you guys all invite me because I, you guys really inspire me. Thank you all so much. and I'm really excited to be here and to share my story in such a beautiful place. When I was 27 years old, I was the walking definition of the American dream. I was a vice president at arguably the most prestigious investment bank in the world, Goldman Sachs, but there were just a few problems with this American dream of mine. The biggest problem with my American dream was that I was not legally part of what defined American. I was a non-documented immigrant, or what some people like to call an illegal alien, a phrase that I really detest, because as soon as you call someone an illegal alien, you've taken away their humanity. You've taken away any chance they ever had of garnering your compassion. We talked about earlier about the Central American children coming to America last summer, and it's been interesting to see, for me to see the coverage of what's happening in Europe right now, of the refugee crisis in Europe. Why is it that we're calling that a refugee crisis? And when we see a very sad image of a toddler drowning, we give them our compassion. But last summer, here in America, we had thousands of Central American children fleeing the same kind of circumstances, poverty, war, hunger. 
but we call them illegal immigrant kids. What's the difference between those two children? They're both seeking the, the same thing, a better life. And I can tell you from personal experience that nobody ever crosses the border, risks their lives to come here, leaves their family and their land behind to come get on welfare. Because if all we wanted to do was to just get by, then we would have stayed where we were. We come to this country for the same reasons that immigrants hundreds of years ago and in every year since our country was founded, we come here to seek the American dream. We come here to seek a better life and to contribute to the country we call home. So there I was, a vice president at Goldman Sachs. I married a United States citizen and that's how I was able to become a citizen of the United States. But I still felt undocumented. I still felt in the shadows because none of my colleagues at Goldman Sachs and none of my friends knew my history. I denied my own history. I was embarrassed of being undocumented or having been undocumented. And living in that fear and in that embarrassment and in that shadow still felt like I was living in a prison. There's a lot of songs in Mexico that talk about the golden prison that is the United States, because here we are, but we can't leave the country. We can't go back and see our families. To me, the biggest, most in my face moment of that prison was when my dad passed away. He was living in Mexico at the time, and I never got to see him alive again. Because if I went back to Mexico, then I wouldn't be able to come back. And that was the toughest day of my life. And I decided that I no longer could be in this country because it didn't matter what I did to earn my stay, this country still didn't want me. And I thought, you know, maybe I can go back to Mexico and maybe I can make a life there and maybe I could do something there. But of course, decisions are never black and white, especially for people in my circumstances. I was dating someone, as I mentioned, and if I left, then I wouldn't be able to be with this person anymore. So that's why we got married, because if I left the country, we would have to break up. But I do want to make something clear, because I think a lot of times you hear people tell undocumented people, why don't you just make yourself legal? Why don't you just get in the back of the line? There is no line. And by the way, I never crossed the border illegally. I came here on a tourist visa. And so do 40% of the undocumented people in this country. So this issue of immigration is not just an issue about the Mexico-US border. Because I came here with a tourist visa, that's one of the biggest reasons that I was able to adjust my status. Had I come here, had I crossed the border, then it wouldn't matter that I was married to a US citizen. It wouldn't matter if I had US citizen children. And that is the reality for so many people today. They have U.S. citizen children, they're married to U.S. citizens, but because of the current immigration system, they can't change their circumstances. I think we've created a caste system here in the United States. It's called our immigration system because it doesn't matter how many barriers we break, it doesn't matter how much we contribute to our society, we still cannot get out of our circumstances. And that is a big problem, and that's where you all come in. I used to be pretty apathetic to politics and to government. Um, and then 2001 happened. And 2001 was the year I graduated high school. And hold on to your seats because you won't believe this. But in 2001, Texas became the first state in the United States to allow undocumented students to go to college. That's the same year I graduated high school. And that was the reason why I was able to have a better life, because I had access to higher education. So you see, laws absolutely have an impact on real people. The laws that get passed or that don't get passed affect people just like me, just like Caesar, just like Erica. People matter, and the reason politics matters is because people matter. The reason immigration should be at the center of this political election and the reason immigration should be an issue we talk about constantly and regularly is not for the reasons that it's being talked about right now. Immigration right now is at the center of the conversation because it's sort of like, what else can we blame on the immigrants? What problems of this country can we tag on to immigration? I've started to think that 
if 3% of the population can be responsible for the national debt and can be responsible for every problem our country has, and we are a pretty powerful group of people. But that's not why immigration should be at the center of the conversation. Immigration should be at the center of, of the conversation because our lives are at risk, because our lives are on the line. That's why immigration should be at the center of the conversation. I left Wall Street in 2014, just a year ago after I became an American citizen. I am now an American citizen, and I want to fight for other people, for Erica and for Cecil, and for thousands more like them to become American citizens. And I realized that I finally had it all. I had a great job. I had a husband who could dance. <laughs> and I had my American citizenship. And when I finally was, took a step back, all I could see was that millions of other people who didn't have what I have. And how unfair that was, because really, me being here today is kind of arbitrary. Yes, I worked really hard in college. Yes, I worked really hard in my internship at Goldman Sachs during a full-time job. I wasn't a vice president at age 27 because I slacked off. So yes, I had worked really hard, but that's not the only reason I was there. I cut a lot of lucky breaks. I never got caught. And the reason I never got caught is because when you look at me and when you hear me speak and when you look at my resume, you never think that that's what an undocumented person looks like. But this is what an undocumented person looks like. And by the way, the people that you normally see on TV or that you hear about in the media who are undocumented people, the people who clean our homes and who garden our gardens, they also deserve the same dignity and the same respect that I do and that you do because they are human beings. Thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited to have shared my story with you. Thank you so much, uh, Angelissa, for those comments. Uh, this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Dean Coyne from the Master's School of Law to give us some remarks about today's um, presentation. Thank you. I, I just want to thank you all for coming, for participating, and thank the international law students for uh, putting on this uh, great event. I'd like to thank our speakers for really sharing these inspiring stories with us. Um, this is a gorgeous building uh, devoted to public service. And uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up here. Uh, my father's office when I was little was down the hallway here. Um, so during the 60s, we would come down here. Uh, we would visit him and then we'd go to the Hall of Flags and we'd go other places. He, he became a lawyer. Um, his, his parents were both immigrants from another country. They came here and had eight kids. Um, he was the one who chose law as the way out of uh, their circumstance. And uh, another brother became a police officer. Uh, another brother became a court worker. Another brother had the need of both a lawyer and a police officer at various times in his life. Um, his sisters became office workers. Uh, what they were was a family together working their way out of the circumstances that their parents found when they first came to this country. Uh, law has always been the opportunity both up the social ladder as well as a means of public service. I think it's especially fitting that as we sit in this building devoted to public service that we think about all the immigrants that have worked here in the past that have tried to not just better themselves, but better their communities because of the work that they engaged in. And in the process, use the law degree, not just for their own benefit, but to benefit the communities that they sprung from, the communities that they returned to, uh, and ultimately that the communities they represent and serve enormously well. So I thank you for allowing me to participate uh, in some small way in this. And I especially thank our international law students and our guests uh, for coming and sharing these stories with us. We know that if you work hard enough in the legal profession, you can accomplish absolutely anything you want to accomplish. And I think it's especially fitting that we think about that, we dedicate ourselves to both public service and the improvement in the lives of others, and we use the law and the legal degree to, in order to obtain that. Thank you. On behalf of the International Law Students Association, thank you so much for coming to our event today. We have a small networking event afterwards, so we can share and get to know each other a little bit better. So thank you so much for coming today.